Um, thank you for everyone for joining us here today. This is the first of our crop specific webinars uh, in our Crop Masters program, our Crop Masters series that Epi Sciences is putting on. We are gonna focus on a different crop each month and talk about the nutrient demands of that crop for that particular time of year and that season. And so for this first month and this first crop specific webinar, we have chosen wine grapes and we're gonna be talking about summer nutrient management of wine grapes. And I think on all of these webinars, we are going to start the presentation with a discussion with a grower of that specific crop. And so today here we have Darren Miller, who is a wine grape grower in Monterey County. And we're just gonna talk a little bit about what's going on with wine grapes right now so we can hear the practicalities of, of what's going on at the ground level in farming wine grapes. Darren, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Darren Miller. I'm a vineyard manager and supervisor here with Monterey Pacific in the Gonzales and Soledad region, uh, actually bordering some of the vineyards. We border the Salinas Valley State Prison and the Soledad State Prison here. And I've been with Monterey Pacific for almost nine years now and had a stint at Constellation Brands uh, as a vineyard manager there as well. Uh, currently, we're really uh, focusing mainly on calcium and getting our bloom sprays finished. Uh, we're, we're in about 60 to 75% bloom right now. And some of the micros that we obviously focus on big are uh, zinc, a little bit of boron, some manganese, uh, magnesium as well. And earlier in the season, obviously we got our nitrogens on and a little bit of zinc through the drip. Um, Steven and I actually worked together for a few years, kind of overseeing the agronomy program that we had on a very, very large scale, a couple of vineyards, of about 4,600 acres. And I think we did a really, uh, really changed the minds and turned around some uh, some ideas over there and really were able to get some really good yields and get some good vigor out of the, the vines that were struggling in some some below sand uh, south of King, King City. So yeah, it's a little bit about me and what I'm doing here now. And um, yeah, go ahead, you got more questions. Yeah, what's going on uh, as far as irrigation? Are you guys timing? How is the evapotranspiration right now? Have we hit any big heat waves yet? Uh, or is it pretty? Pretty average. Yeah, well, that's, that's pretty timely. We actually really have not yet. It's been really windy and pretty cool. So our canopies are just getting to almost full canopy. We need, a, need a good heat wave, which we actually have in store for us, I think, next week. It's looking like we're going to get, you know, up to mid-90s. And even in the South Valley of Salinas Valley, we'll get closer to triple digits. Uh, it's going to be pretty useful. And we're, the idea is right now we're, um, you know, we're just getting through fruit set. So we are going to try to regulate some some deficit irrigations, but we really want to make sure we get our full canopies before we start dialing back water. So I'll go out and look at some of our weather stations and compare it to some historicals and look at it at evaporation rates of, you know, probably 1.5 to 1.6 or seven, even in the hotter areas for the whole week. And what I kind of do is I, I try to calculate a crop coefficient that I use for my irrigation scheduling. And then I kind of put in like a management factor so to speak based on each block and the vigor that we see uh, visually and then basing off of our soil moisture sensors we, we like to use as many tools as we can and we actually incorporate some toolie sensors uh, kind of doing a lot less pressure bombs these days because there's just so many variables that go into that and the readings never seem to be quite as accurate as we had hoped so right now being that we have a pretty good heat wave coming on we're going to be trying to irrigate a little bit more uh, tomorrow and Saturday, and then pour on a little bit more water, looking at like the eight to 10 to 12 hours, obviously dependent on the block, uh, the bigger, the rootstock and the application rates. So it's kind of the gist of where we go and we just do it off of per block and per ranch. And obviously it has a lot to do with our soil water holding capacities, so. Right, yeah, it's complicated with all those different blocks and, and variations. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got a question for you. Just, um, I, I heard a, an interesting idea from a different vineyard management team that still has some bloom out there. And they're looking at that approaching heat wave that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And they have sprinklers because of uh, helping to prevent frost damage and are wondering, and this is a question for you, do you think turning on the sprinklers during a major heat event at bloom could help reduce um, any sort of reduction in fruit set? because of that high heat 
and, 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 and very low humidity during bloom. Should you turn on the sprinklers? I would be very cautious and careful about it, just being that uh, particular vineyard probably got quite a bit of water during the frost season, I imagine. And I'm, I'd be more worried about seeing more shatter with water going on the flowers and the pistils and stones. And I think, uh, I think you're almost better off to let the vine just put on the water you can with the drip system. And if you want to trial some blocks, it might be cool to see how it does, but I would just be very, uh, I would be a little reluctant to put on sprinklers based on that heat and the mildew pressures that would come after that. I just don't see that being as much of an effect. I think you'd be much better off waiting till a little later in the season, even, you know, maybe in the August timeframe, maybe on the first heat wave of the season, which is really what we're kind of seeing next week. I think you'd be better off to just check your soil moisture, check your tendrils and your vigor and just put on the water that you can. I mean, you know, if you're in a situation where you cannot irrigate very quickly across your, your property or your, your particular blocks, maybe it would be viable to put some sprinklers on. But it's, uh, to me, it just can be can be a little bit of a waste, too, and you end up just growing a lot of weeds. Granted, it can be very helpful as well for the vines to really develop some more roots, to, uh, systems and structures to, to chase that water all across the entirety of the block, not just your normal wetting pattern from your drip irrigations. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely an interesting concept. And I think you hit it on the head is maybe do a trial this year and see what, uh, where you had better fruits at turning the sprinklers on during a high heat event at bloom, seeing if that helped. Yeah. I know they do some evaporative cooling in other crops like apples and cherries in the middle of the, the summer in Washington when it gets really hot, but it's always after fruit set. And so that would be different at bloom. Yeah. yeah. Hey, another so, yeah. question for you, maybe people would find interesting to hear about uh, any advancements in automated spraying in vineyard management right now? Yeah, there are beginning to be more and more. And the, the main company I've been in discussions with is it's called Gus. It's a global unmanned spray system based out of Kingsburg. They have some sprayers mostly focused on the pistachio and almond groves. They're about eight feet wide, so they're a little wide for majority of our vineyard rows here. Um, but I've been Researching with them, their, uh, their developments with the, the vineyard model, which is supposed to be six feet wide with a actual spray tower in the back. So we're really encouraged to be able to demo those later this year is the hope if they can uh, get all the parts and microchips and things like that that are very hard to come by right now to, to manufacture some of these models to be able to demo those in some of the vineyards here in the valley and even in San Joaquin, obviously. And I know there's also a Monarch tractor. It's all electric and uh, robotic that a lot of people are looking into to at least utilize maybe for mowing or maybe in some spray operations pretty soon as well. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a bit out there. There's a, another a weed knife machine that a lot of row crop growers are using in the area. There's, there's FarmWise and then there's another one called Now Technologies uh, from Europe that I've been really interested in. It actually straddles and goes over the row and it'll do a... Uh, weed knives so instead of having to spray as much you could almost can maybe run that thing all night and day and you know it's it's beginning to get there what's what's really attractive to us about maybe utilizing a sprayer like a gus especially is because it gets so windy here in the beginning of the season when mildew control sprays are so critical we really would love to be able to means during the night when the winds are much lower and maybe have one uh, supervisor or foreman managing two or three or even four of these machines at once and be able to kind of just chase those around do the tank mixes fill them and, and get covered a lot more ground and get our spray intervals a lot you know more accurate and then be able to utilize more of our our day-to-day -day tractor drivers for the things that we tend to get behind on when we have you know so many different cultural and herbicide sprays that need to go on and mowing I mean there's a time frame in May and June where there's just so many different activities that we need to juggle. And it's, it's really challenging when we have to drop everything we're doing to focus on doing, staying on top of our spray intervals that take the majority of our, our man and women power to, uh, to complete, so. Yeah, great. Yeah. Interesting, okay. Um, uh, one last question here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Darren, uh, the background there might confuse you uh, being oranges, but Darren is the manager of, uh, many acres of wine grape. Can you tell us what varieties and in Monterey County that you guys grow? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the background is based off of my uh, my family's farming operation where my dad grows citrus and avocados. I kind of fell into the Salinas Valley managing more vineyards up here uh, with a friend that we'd started some, some vineyard management company with. And right now, the main varieties that we focus on in this in this area are Pinot and Chardonnay. And we do also some, some Syrah, some Sauvignon Blanc, some Pinot Grigio, uh, but a lot less of the, the hotter varietals. We do have a pretty big, significant acreage block or vineyard down in east of King City where we do have some Cabernet Sauvignon and some some Grenache and some of the Rome varietals as well, uh, even some Pickpool Blanc, but the majority of Salinas Valley still remains uh, a lot of Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs is what many of the buyers are really kind of looking for. And But there's some, beginning to be some trends of uh, Sauvignon Blanc is definitely pretty hot right now. Even Merlot is starting to make a kind of comeback and you know, a few other, even Gewurztraminer in some cases, Gala has a big interest in. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of capabilities and uh, potential for this these climates to do really well. It's just some of the hotter Bordeaux varietals really need to be in the King City, San Arno, San Lucas areas where we get the enough growing degree days for the year to ripen them. So. Right. All about that climate. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Well, really appreciate you uh, telling us what's going on right now in, in farming wine grapes this time of year, Darren. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Very good. And we're going to move on to the presentation now focusing just on nutrient management uh, for summer wine grapes. Thanks again, Darren. Okay, hopefully uh, everybody can see my screen here right now. Brittany, does that look uh, look good for you here? Yes, that looks good. Great, thank you very much. Um, you all got to meet Darren Miller, uh, vineyard manager, manager there in Monterey County of Wine Grapes. I am Steve Easterby, agronomist for FB Sciences in the Western United States. Today we are presenting on wine grapes, summer nutrient management. This is the first in our crop series of our uh, crop management master series that the sciences is going to be putting on each month. The itinerary here, we already covered our grower discussion and now we'll be talking about the different summer crop stages of wine grapes. So looking at June, July, and August and focusing in on those months and what's going on in those crop stages. Nutrient recommendations that can really have an impact on these stages, sort of peak nutrient demands for this time of year. And then at the very end, a few product recommendations that can help fulfill those nutrient requirements. And then we can follow up with some questions and discussions. And uh, there is a question and answer uh, feature of the Zoom. So if you can type in any questions you have during the presentation and after the presentation, we'll try to answer all of those. So these are the three main uh, crop stages we are gonna focus on here. And we've created this neat timeline here uh, down at the bottom, you can see we have a general timeline of when they occur. Now, of course, when these crop stages occur in California is going to vary drastically depending upon the geographical location. So Napa and Sonoma is going to look very different than Lodi, which is going to look very different from Monterey County and Paso Robles County down to Santa Barbara County and Ventura County. But in general, we have uh, shoot and leaf growth occurring here at the beginning, uh, June through July still. And then flower bud initiation, we'll talk on that. And then these different berry growth stages. Uh, and, and over here, this overview, and we can see these nutrient recommendations that we're gonna focus in on for those particular stages. Now, before we begin, I did want to uh, mention here that the following recommendations I give are to highlight particular nutrients that may have a big impact on the crop stages that we are talking about. It is not meant to be an all-inclusive nutrient program. You are still needing to look at all of nutrients throughout the entire season. And so this is especially uh, dependent upon what your tissue tests are saying, what your soil tests are saying, visual observations, previous history, and what you've already put out this year. Um, and so the following nutrient recommendations are really just to try to capture that period of time where there is a peak demand and that we believe may have a big impact on the crop now. 
So still keep doing whatever uh, you are doing throughout the year and what has worked. These are just some, um, some ideas of really what can, can work for that particular time. Again, those three processes that we are gonna discuss are shoot and leaf growth and uh, how we can impact that, bud development, what nutrients we can focus in on to impact that process. And then finally, berry growth, what it's all about, what farming wine grapes is really focused on in the end is, is growing those berries. And so how can we manage that to the best of our abilities and to create high quality and high yielding vines? Shoot and leaf growth, that has been occurring since, um, since the early spring when we had emergence of shoots uh, and there was rapid canopy growth going on in these early spring and early summer months. Now that shoot growth is going to continue in the early summer, but it really is gonna to start to slow down. It's gonna continue and then slow down up until June and mid uh, to mid late July in these later, um, later maturing areas. But that, while that shoot and leaf growth is still occurring, uh, we still we want to encourage that growth and build that canopy, as Darren mentioned, to the best of our abilities. Now that canopy is going to be the thing that is feeding our grapes. That canopy is going to be producing the carbohydrates and sugars and other desirable compounds that we want to go into wine grapes. So for this earlier part of the summer, we are still focusing on building up that canopy until finally, as I said, once the vine switches from building up the canopy and then focusing almost exclusively on berry growth that happens in mid and definitely later summer, that is when we turn away from shoot and leaf growth. But in this earlier part, we are still looking at it. So this timing focus really in general is about June. Of these three months we're talking about, June is when we're still talking about uh, focusing on building that shoot and, and leaf growth. Now the three important nutrients that I've highlighted here that I've chosen is nitrogen, zinc and manganese. And again, of course, there's other nutrients that go into play for leaf development and shoot growth. But these are three that I think have particular importance, especially in California and the Western United States. And so those are the ones I wanted to highlight. Nitrogen first. Uh, I like to talk about nitrogen with wine grapes because I think that nitrogen has uh, become a bad word in agriculture, especially in the wine grape industry. And I think that's uh, while there is some, um, some background behind that, I think that it's a little bit overdone. Uh, wine, nitrogen is still the most important nutrient to plant life. It is involved and needed for almost every process that occurs in a plant, including, including that growth and development of the actual berries. And so not only do shoot and leaves have a high demand for nitrogen, but actually those developing clusters, those berries have a huge demand for nitrogen. There is a higher demand for nitrogen in those berries than there is in the leaves and the shoots. Now, of course, to manage premium wine grapes, we want to manage nitrogen to uh, very closely, very finely and not overdo it. When we overdo nitrogen, what happens? We have a huge canopy size and we do not have high quality grapes. We can even um, result in fruit that rots quicker at harvest time. But I have seen and, and I've taken a lot of soil tests in different vineyards uh, throughout the state that because of this bad, bad image that nitrogen has had, um, and particularly in California, a lot of growers are really underdoing it on their nitrogen applications. They're scared of applying nitrogen. And when you do that, you are having an impact not only on your yield, but you can also have an impact on your quality as well. Um, nitrogen is actually needed for the, uh, for the fermentation process. The yeast actually feed on nitrogen when they are fermenting in those vats when the wine is being produced. And although wineries may, may never uh, admit this, um, there is great research that has shown that insufficient nitrogen can lead to stuck fermentation and even that raw and egg order, odor. Um, there's other things that come into play too with stuck fermentation, but a very extreme deficiency in nitrogen can also lead to that stuck fermentation because that yeast does not have anything to feed upon and to start fermenting. Uh, definitely, you would hear that don't apply hardly any nitrogen at all to wine grapes. And we certainly don't want to apply as much as you're putting out with a corn crop or a lettuce crop or almonds, nothing, nowhere near that much. But it still needs to be managed. And the best way to do that is to check those petioles. I think with nitrogen specifically, petioles are a more accurate representation of your nitrogen status than the leaf analysis, but both are good. Check those leaf and petioles and, and, uh, and soil tests as well, um, but know that nitrogen is necessary and don't think that being deficient in nitrogen is going to lead to 
uh, a better wine crop. It's going to reduce yield and even can reduce quality. The form taken up is nitrate, of course, and also ammonium as well. And mobility, very high in the soil and plants, so a very mobile nutrient. Next nutrient I wanted to mention here for shoot and leaf growth is zinc. Zinc is crucially important for leaf development. It is needed for the formation of those chloroplasts where the photosynthesis is taking place. Uh, and it's also needed for that process of shoot elongation. Um, that's why we see when a zinc deficient vine, we'll see a very short internode spacing between those internodes because of that lack of zinc. So zinc's needed for that and also membrane integrity. The reason that uh, for that is that zinc is needed for this reduction of oxidative stress. We have these, uh, with this process of energy creation inside the plant, there are these free radicals and oxygen compounds that can have an, uh, a negative effect on the health of a plant, reduce that membrane integrity. Zinc is actually needed to reduce that oxidative stress and maintain membrane integrity. And so that is how zinc is taking apart in the shoot and leaf growth. It is taken up. Um, through the roots as the divalent cation of zinc. A mobility is low in the soil and low in the plant as well. Uh, zinc deficiencies, you'll often see them in early summertime. You'll see that modeling of those leaves in the younger leaves. And uh, we do need to apply a form of zinc to the soil that is chelated or complex in some way, in some uh, very effective way, especially in Western soils. Uh, zinc deficiencies are common on calcareous soils, where we often grow wine grapes, and high clay soils, sandy soils as well, see a lot of deficiencies. So applying a soil applied form of zinc, which is chelated effectively, is going to ensure that you have um, a form of zinc that can actually be taken up by the plant. Uh, when you see a deficiency out there, it is time to apply soil zinc, but the best way to overcome a deficiency of zinc is a foliar application. And that's when you'll see the biggest impact and quickest impact. And so an effective foliar application too can help overcome those, those deficiencies. And that final nutrient I wanted to mention here for the shoot and leaf growth stage we're seeing in June is manganese. Uh, zinc and manganese are, are sort of partners. They go hand in hand and manganese is very essential although in a small quantity um, for some very important roles. The first is, and this is kind of a neat thing to remember when you're thinking of why is manganese necessary for plant growth, it has the singular role of being the nutrient necessary to actually split the water molecule in photosynthesis. So photosynthesis two is this complex um, where this, this reaction of light is occurring and water is being split into oxygen and protons, and that's helping to create the ATP necessary for that, for that photosynthesis process to occur. And so that water molecule is actually split because of manganese. And even in these alternative forms of energy, and we're trying to split water, you know, hydrogen, hydrogen energy and that sort of thing, they're using manganese as the catalyst because it is very effective in doing this process. And so when you have a manganese deficiency, that is the thing that is most effective uh, affected by that deficiency is this process of splitting the water molecule and photosynthesis to create that proton necessary for ATP. So photosynthesis, just in end, it does not happen without sufficient manganese and you are going to limit the production of your leaves with that deficiency. So that's why manganese is needed there. It's also a enzyme activator. And when I've heard this in the past, um, you know, nutrients are involved in enzyme such and such, it never really uh, did anything for me. I need to have, a, a, like, how is that practically speaking? What does that mean in enzyme activator? Well, one is it's, it's activating the enzyme involved with the Krebs cycle. And you, you guys know what the Krebs cycle is. That is the energy, that is the energy cycle where uh, indirectly ATP is created to produce energy for the plant. It's also called the, uh, the TCA cycle, um, citric acid cycle, and uh, we're harvesting energy electrons from carbon fuels and, and creating energy. So manganese is the enzyme necessary for that Krebs cycle to occur. And also it is activating the enzymes for flavonoids. So those are the anthocyanin, anthocyanins and tannins, which are the color and mouthfeel of wine. So manganese, an enzyme activator, why is that important? Creating these anthocyanins and tannins. And that's what we like to have in our, uh, our mouthfeel, uh, especially of red uh, wine grapes. Um, and, and also related to uh, wine grape quality factors, carotenoid biosynthesis, 
that is also dependent on sufficient manganese. So carotenoids, those are um, a certain pigment, which is actually also an antioxidant you'll find in other foods. And it also is involved with the wine aroma. So the biosynthesis of those carotenoids is dependent upon sufficient manganese and all of these different psych, um, processes going on. And so that is why I think that it, during this stage of growth, there is a high demand for nitrogen, for zinc and manganese. It's important to focus in on these nutrients and make sure there is more than sufficient amounts in your soil and tissue test and look at visual symptoms um, to ensure that you have enough for all these different processes. Like zinc, the form taken up by plant roots is that divalent cation of manganese. Very simple there. Mobility again is low in the plant and low in the soil. So we do need a chelated form of manganese in the soil to ensure uptake of the roots and a form of manganese if applied as a foliar that is mobile within the phloem because traditionally uh, manganese is very immobile within the plant as well. So we do need a form of foliar application that can ensure a flow and mobility of that manganese. The next stage I want to talk about is dormant bud development. Um, this is often an overlooked crop growth stage in perennial crops. Now I do see and, and hear a lot more talk on focusing in on bud development and ensuring the healthy development of those buds in perennial crops in tree crops. So almond and pistachio growers are really starting to think about proper nutrition during this bud development stage, because what we're doing now nutritionally is obviously gonna affect next year's growth because next year's shoots and flowers are developing within these dormant buds this year. So here I have a picture, a uh, photo credit goes out to Jesus um, Chewy. She took this photo out there. Uh, as you can see here, this was the, these shoots here came out of the buds that developed the previous year. This was taken this year, 2021. So these buds right here, which, um, which have led to shoot growth and flowers, as you can see, those developed in the year 2020. And then this year that shoot growth emerged. And now we can see we have some dormant buds here after which uh, after harvest takes place, they may be going through here and pruning and cutting right here, maybe cutting up here, I'm not sure but cutting someplace and leaving enough of these buds so that next year, these shoots can telescope out from these dormant buds. I like that term telescoping out because it really conveys what is happening in a wine grape shoot where it has the, the DNA to create both the shoots and the tendrils and the leaves and the flower clusters. So right now these buds are developing and there are certain factors that go into, uh, go into place to make sure that that bud fruitfulness is ensured. Uh, some of the biggest things that we try to manage is the light penetration into that canopy because bud fruitfulness is directly related to how much light they get. That's why canopy management is so key because we do need to have some amount of light getting into those buds, too little light, and that bud fruitfulness is, is shot. Uh, also temperature, things get really hot and especially when things get really cold is going to negatively affect bud fruitfulness. Uh, carbohydrate reserves as well. If this year the, the wine grape, those, those grapes, um, these vines burn through all of their carbohydrates, next year the carbohydrate reserves in the plant to feed those buds is not going to be sufficient to result in a, a very fruitful vine. So you want to make sure that even if you have, a, especially if you have a big yield this year, you are supplying that, that vine uh, during the season or post harvest with enough nutrients to create the carbohydrates necessary to build up that reserve. And then finally, nutrient status. If a vine is deficient in one particular nutrient this year, especially key nutrients, not only will it affect the crop this year, it's also gonna affect the crop next year because buds are developing now and they need all these essential nutrients to have proper development. So here I have a pretty neat diagram. Um, the spring of the first year, we have our shoot here, and this is where the bud is developing. And this is 10 weeks later from, uh, from the spring. This is the early summer. And so now this is what we're talking about in, in June and July, this early summer part where the bud is developing. And as you can see here, we have the flower cluster primordia developing right here. And that is gonna telescope out and be that flower cluster next year. And so this bud does need to have proper nutrition available to it to develop um, in good health and to be fruitful next year. And then next year, we are gonna have that shoot growth come out 
and then we will have that, that flower cluster. And so bud development actually takes place from the early summer, June, all the way through the winter and early, or early fall. But there's, and that's for the bud development as a whole, but for that flower cluster initiation, when that flower cluster primordia is developing, that is from June until Verasion. So more, so earlier in the summer. So that's why we're targeting now to make sure that that flower cluster primordia has the proper nutrition. And so that is why, and this is sort of a, a different sort of thinking. I've, I've chosen boron as the nutrient to highlight for this period of flower cluster initiation within bud development. Now, boron is oftentimes thought of as a bloom time nutrient or a pre-bloom nutrient. And for good reason, it is essential to proper fruit set and uh, pollen integrity. And it, but it is also essential for, uh, for some other very important processes. One is bud development, as we're talking about. It is also essential for the structure and function of cell walls. Cell walls are primarily composed of, of calcium and nitrogen uh, and, other, um, and other compounds, which, which rely on other nutrients. But boron is actually used as a, a link between those calcium containing cell walls. Boron is actually uh, bringing together that, that cell wall and holding it together um, because of these cross linkages that rely on boron. So not only is boron essential for fruit set and flower, but also for the formation of the cell wall. And it really benefits rapid berry growth because of that, its role in cell wall um, creation. And during June, we are now post fruit set, we have rapidly growing cells. They are rapidly dividing and expanding. So that creates a huge demand for calcium, but also boron. And so this is the time of year when you can actually see uh, a deficiency of boron start to occur um, in the springtime and also in midsummer because the vines burn through its boron supply because of this process of rapid berry growth and that pollination. Now, I, I mentioned a, considering a, a boron management and a boron application in June, which is not traditional, because of two reasons. One is that bloom time, sometimes those applications become a little bit too late. Uh, that application might go out right there at bloom and maybe that vine is not taking it up and not having an impact on that, uh, that pollination process right then. It's still good to, to put on there, but sometimes it doesn't happen or sometimes too late. Post-harvest, I think may be the best time to apply boron. However, it just, uh, because of the logistics and harvest going on, that application sometimes just doesn't happen. And so I think that to avoid trying to get it out and not succeeding in getting it out, and also to avoid any deficiencies that could affect bud development this year, if a boron application has not already gone out, um, I would check a uh, definitely tissue test and, and, and consider a very small application of boron via the soil or foliar. And I say very small because why, there is a fine line between toxicity and deficiency in grapes for boron. Not a, um, we can't have no boron, can't have too little, and definitely can't have too much. So a small application lower on the, the ranges of fertilizer recommendations is where I would go and apply that in June and ensure that proper bud development is taking place. Boron is very mobile in the soil unless we have high calcium for which it can then be um, bound up by that calcium in the soil. Uh, it is also, it is unfortunately low mobility in the plant. Now some plant species do have a higher boron mobility. However, in grapes, it is low boron, uh, low mobility of boron. The form taken up by the plant and the soil is boric acid as the form uh, taken up of boron. So we had shoot and leaf growth. That uh, crop stage uh, is occurring now this summer and also the bud development. And then finally, I do wanna talk about berry growth. Now this is what wine grape farming is all about, growing those berries, having healthy, large berries uh, of, of high quality. And that is the fun part of, of uh, grape farming. We have to grow those leaves and shoots to uh, feed these berries, but it is the, that these berries are the fun things to watch grow throughout the year. And we have three different phases that are occurring. The first is rapid berry growth, and that is occurring from uh, early May uh, in the earlier maturing varieties to early July in these later varieties. And then we have lag phase, and that's going to occur uh, about July, again, depending on your location. And then finally, verasion, mid-July mid to late August. 
this is a really interesting uh, representation here of what's going on with berries. Now in this first part of the year, which I'll talk about, we have rapid growth of green berries. And these green berries are being fed by the xylem primarily, also the phloem, but the xylem is definitely sending up water and minerals taken up by the plant roots. Now, a, a key point here is that at veration, the xylem flow ceases, uh, it really slows down and then stops. And so then those berries are only being fed by the phloem. And that is when the color starts to transform and we have solutes going into the berries via the phloem. And then another important point is uh, very late in berry development, even the phloem, um, the phloem vessels start to close up as well and occlude. And so even the phloem stops feeding the berries in the end. But first it's xylem and phloem together, xylem stops and then the, the phloem takes over in that berry ripening stage. So first is rapid berry growth. After fruit set, cells are dividing, they are enlarging very quickly. This is early May to early July. We have firm berries, they are dark green. They are very sour. If you go and bite into them, very sour. Um, they actually double in size during this period because of those, those processes. The uh, tartaric and malic acid uh, is accumulating. That's why they're so sour. Tartaric acid in the skins, malic acid mainly in the flesh. And then also tannins are accumulating and that's coming um, mainly from our skin and our seed is that's when the tannins are building up. So the two nutrients I want to focus on for this rapid berry growth stage uh, from you know, early May to early July is calcium and zinc. The reason you want to look at calcium at this stage is because those berries, they are rapidly, um, as I said, building new cell walls and calcium is that structural nutrient in cell walls. It is unique in that way it is the nutrient that has a structural purpose in the cell wall. It is needed to form new cell walls. And so that cell wall integrity is needed uh, to create mini berries and large berries as they expand. And it's also needed for integrity against natural fungal resistance. Uh, higher calcium content is going to reduce the colonization of fungus such as powdery mildew and botrytis. And so including calcium in foliar sprays and our fungicidal materials is a, a very healthy and natural way to reduce our fungal infection. The form taken up by the plant is the divalent cation of calcium and the mobility is low in the plant and also low in the soil. The other nutrient I wanna talk about is zinc. <clears throat> now zinc is important because just like with shooting leaf growth that had certain uh, requirements with rapid berry growth, zinc is responsible for uh, a phytohormone called auxin. And the main auxin that we look at is indolacetic acid. Now zinc is necessary for indolacetic acid to form. And it is this indolacetic acid, this auxin, which is uh, what is driving cell division and expansion. And as we said, these berries are dividing and expanding very rapidly. And so this phytohormone is needed for that process to occur. And that's where zinc comes into play. And that also plays into seed development. Uh, zinc is needed for this hormone of this, uh, for auxin, which is what is leading to seed development. And the size of uh, wine grape fruit is strongly correlated, correlated with, seed develop, uh, with seed number. So if, if you look at a wine grape, that only has one seed, it's gonna be much smaller than a, uh, a grape that has four seeds. So the more seeds that we have, the larger the fruit size is. Uh, and more seeds also means more calcium. Where seeds, where there are more seeds, calcium is actually coming into as well. And we need that um, for these, this berry growth. And then finally, benefiting, it benefits bud fertility. Zinc is very important to bud fertility. Uh, deficient zinc, uh, you know, hen and chick disorder and shot berries, that can be associated with a zinc deficiency actually. And so all of these regions, these uh, reasons, cell division expansion needs zinc, um, seed formation, which is cor uh, correlates with grape berry size, and then bud fertility and, and reducing hen and chick disorder and shot berries all require some zinc. Lag phase this is that middle phase where the berry growth stops uh, and really slows down. The berries start to lose their chlorophyll the acidity and tannins continue to accumulate, um, and the, but then sugar increase starts to begin. 
and then carbohydrate gain increases. So the important nutrient I wanted to talk about there was potassium. Now you should have some potassium already on by now, but, but this is really the stage to start applying it. And I say that because the next stage is where a huge demand starts to take place. So I think it's smart to be ahead of that demand. Deficiencies can occur where we have a heavy crop or cal calcium or magnesium high in our soil will antagonize potassium and water stress as well. So during this lag phase, this is kind of a, a warning sign. Get a lot of potassium on there, either foliar and especially soil applications because of that huge demand. The form taken up is the uh, monovalent cation of potassium. Mobility is moderate in the soil, uh, but high in the plants. <clears throat> There. Then finally, we have this stage of erasion. This is the exciting stage. We start to see that color forming on the grapes. Um, very fun. Now the grapes start to be sweet or start to become sweet. Uh, this is occurring from mid-July through late August is when we see erasion begin. Growth accelerates again. So after a lag phase, now we got growth happening. <clears throat> Berries now double in size again from lag phase until where they will be at harvest because of cell enlargement now. So not so much, not so much di cell division anymore, just that enlargement. The acidity decreases, sugars increase, and the berries soften and the color change starts to happen. And those aromas and flavors start to accumulate. So now the, the two important nutrients at this stage that I wanted to highlight was calcium and potassium. Potassium, because I said before during lag phase, there's a huge demand for potassium during fruit ripening. It is needed for the formation of all these sugars and starches that we, which we need to have in our, inside of our grapes. And it also helps to maintain our water balance. As we know, potassium is, is needed to help regulate that osmotic potential. So later in the season, uh, if we see these older leaves start to have a darker pigmentation is because there is a potassium deficiency. And even if it's severe, there'll be some leaf curling and, and browning. Um, and we're going to have reduced soluble solid ac accumulation, reduced berry size, and, and poor color can all have <clears throat> come into play if we have a potassium deficiency. So this is definitely the period of time where you want to get as much potassium on there as is healthy for um, that crop. And then finally, calcium. Calcium important during that rapid berry growth stage, but also in verasion as well. And this is why um, we have the, the famous debate between winemaker and, uh, and great farmer uh, come uh, harvest time, right? The winemaker wants those berries to have a high skin to juice ratio. They want those bricks to be you know, as high as we can get them. And they want to wait, us to wait, turn off the water and wait until that happens. Now the winemaker, I mean, the great farmer says, well, hey, I'm getting paid by the ton. I'd rather not have tiny berries. Uh, I will get those bricks up as much as, I, as high as you need them, but I'm not going to starve my berries uh, of water. And so there's this debate and this fight between winemaker, grape farmer every year, and, and maybe always will be. But here's some, some, interesting, uh, some interesting things about grape physiology. As we said before, those xylem vessels first close around verasion. And so there is not xylem flow going into those grapes. Now the phloem eventually closes in late summer as well. And so we're not seeing a huge flush of water late season into berries because the, the vessels through that stem have actually closed up. Now water is still evaporating through the skin. So berries can still lose the water through their skin. Um, but watering after verasion, late, late after verasion, it, it will reduce stress and it's gonna prevent further water loss but it's not putting water back into the berries. And so early in the year that will happen. Berries can, can lose and gain water and, and they will do that to a large extent visually, you can see that. But late in the year, watering back, and I bet Darren likes to hear this, um, is not gonna push back, uh, is not gonna fill up and swell up those berries because those channels have been closed off to the berry. Although it will reduce stress and prevent further water loss. And so it can be good in that way. So why, why does this play into calcium? Um, because there's this, this debate every year, I think it's a good reason to apply calcium, uh, especially foliar calcium, because there's a lot of studies that have shown that high calcium berries show lower berry transpiration rates throughout development. So from that verasion through post-verasion, a higher calcium content 
lower transpiration, we're losing less water. And so regardless of if we can get water on or not, or irrigating or not, we're at least not transpiring and losing too much water while still getting those bricks to where they need to be. And sufficient calcium prevents that early berry water loss um, because we have lower post-foration berry transpiration. <clears throat> ah, now we've gotten to our, our, our product recommendations and what we think, how I think that some of these products that Episcientist has can fulfill some of these demands at this times of year. One is an interesting one here. This is a slow release nitrogen. As I said before, there is a demand for nitrogen in grapes. However, it is, it is not nearly as high as other crops, but still just as necessary. Uh, this is an interesting product here where we're testing it out on vegetables in, replace, uh, in the Salinas Valley in replace of huge doses of soil nitrogen if we can feed the canopy with a more uh, efficient source of slow release nitrogen. When applied through the canopy, that uh, urea, it is first goes on as urea, but the conversion eventually to amino acids is slowed down. And so it's sort of spoon feeding the canopy with that nitrogen. It actually enhances the uptake of whatever else you're spraying as well, because it, it reduces the drying of that, uh, of that spray. So you'll see a shinier canopy afterward and that low humidity, high heat, you're not just gonna get instant evaporation of, of your spray. And so it really helps that spray to uh, not dry as quickly. Um, we go out there at a one to four quarts an acre with that. It can also be applied uh, through the soil as well to the similar effect. And then zinc um, for shooting leaf growth stage, also benefiting that early berry growth. These are some of the zinc products that we carry. We are pretty famous for our, our zinc uh, nutrient products in particular. Uh, the foliar ones we have is a, a zinc foliar. We do use these sugar-based organic acids. The reason being that sugar in the phloem, uh, it can be complex with low molecular weight organic solutes. Uh, research has shown that a zinc sulfate on its own <clears throat> is not going to be mobile within the phloem, but when you add these low molecular weight organic solutes, such as these sugar-based organic acids we use that really improves translocation. Uh, so that zinc foliar we have is 6% zinc and 1% manganese. We also have a similar one that uh, includes magnesium too, if that was to be desired, a, a good 2 to 2 ratio there called chlorodrive. And then finally, through the soil, uh, if that is your, your method of, of preference for applying zinc, we do have Zycron soil. This is our zinc product, which is chelated and is not chelated with synthetic chelates, which can have negative, uh, maybe iffy effects on soil microbes and, and plant health. We do use these organic acids, which are very effective in chelating zinc in our Zycron uh, zincs product. And that is 6% zinc and 1% manganese. We actually have a CAN-17 compatible version of that, which can go out with CAN-17. So if you are applying a lot of your calcium via the soil, um, CAN-17 in this time of year or CN9, uh, we do have a great zinc product, which is fully compatible. We've worked with Yara Viva on creating that as well. It goes out at one to four quarts an acre. And then some of the calcium products to fill that calcium demand we talked about during that rapid berry growth stage. Uh, CAN-17 and CN9 are great products for applying calcium. An alternative one we have too is Calron soil. This one I think is great for a high alkalinity soil. So where you have a high pH, the reason being is it is chelated with some of those organic acids I mentioned, but it's also extremely low in pH, like a one or a two pH. I mean, it is, it is going to free up bicarbonates and actually solubilize calcium that's in the soil itself. And so high, high pH situations um, for calcium because calcium can be bound up with those bicarbonates in the soil and high alkalinity. Uh, this is actually chelated and acidic, a uh, great option there. Low in nitrogen, uh, especially useful for later in the year when you're trying to back off nitrogen. And then the two foliar uh, calcium products we have is a cellmate foliar. This is great for that earlier uh, rapid berry growth phase. When I mentioned that both calcium and boron needed for that rapid berry growth, and we only want a small amount of boron going out in wine grapes because of that fine line, um, this is a great ratio, 8% calcium and half a percent boron. So we do get calcium to feed that rapidly growing berry and a small amount of boron that will not only help uh, with that cell wall creation, but also with that dormant bud development taking place from uh, June until verasion. 
And then we have bounce back foliar. Um, I'm gonna talk about that one too. Great at this stage for rapid berry growth, but also really good at the verasion stage. Bounce back foliar, that is our calcium product uh, that includes seaweed as well. So it's 8% calcium <clears throat> and also includes uh, seaweed. And that's great because both of those, pro uh, both calcium and seaweed are great at reducing heat stress. And also when seaweed is applied at uh, post verasion, it has been proven with some recent trials to improve anthocyanin and phenolic content. Uh, this was a trial down there. You can see the, the research article there. I got that from. Um, this was shown in, in Italy and in Michigan on wine grapes. It hastened verasion and improved anthocyanin and phenolic content. So bounce back foliar, uh, great calcium seaweed uh, product there, one to two four quarts an acre. And then for our potassium product, this is a product we came out with this year. Um, to supplement potassium in the verasion period uh, for grapes, it is it works fantastic uh, at in improving solute uh, formation and sugars into those berries. Uh, it does help with coloring as well and raising bricks. And we actually use potassium acetate, which is well known in the industry as having a uh, what we consider an elite absorption rate compared to other potassium products. Very high absorption rate of this potassium acetate but at the same time, it has a very low salt index. So it has a even less than half the salt index of potassium nitrate, meaning when you put it out there, it's not gonna burn anything. It is very clean, uh, very high uptake without having that burn potential. So that goes out at a one to four quarts an acre. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that all of those, all those products here um, not only do they have those attributes that I mentioned, but they also include our unique blend of organic acids derived from natural organic matter called FBS Transit. And that is a biostimulant that we incorporate into all of our products, which uh, helps to improve that nutrient mobility of those immobile nutrients in the plant traditionally, um, helps improve that mobility and reduce that abiotic stress, especially that can come from heat stress late in the season. So those are some product recommendations. You can find all of that information too on our website uh, we have these great crop programs that we have all worked hard to put together and showing the different crop stages and the nutrients that we recommend for those crop stages. Uh, this is the wine grape pro program. It's there on our website and it's going to have all those nutrients um, that I mentioned and, and the corresponding products that, uh, that will support them. So I encourage you to check that out. I uh, really appreciate everybody dropping in today and uh, viewing our truck and, and really appreciate Darren also sharing with us his experience right now farming wine grapes and what's going on out there. Uh, any other questions that you guys have, I'd love to hear. You can type it in that Q&A function on, the, on Zoom right now or in the chat and we will try to answer any questions that you guys might have. <clears throat> Okay, I see one question here. Um, someone, uh, Jacob, uh, asked, uh, do you still advise applying foliar potassium uh, even during high heat periods? Um, yes, we do advise still, still during high heat periods later in the summer applying potassium foliar. I think that it should definitely go out when the temperature is below 90 degrees. Um, as any foliar application should go out, preferably not in the heat of the day, but actually foliar potassium during high heat periods can help supplement that, that uh, requirement for potassium to moderate heat stress. And that's gonna be, that's because it's helping to moderate transpiration. And that is the, re the way that plants can get rid of that heat stress within them, uh, within the leaves and even within the grapes um, up into a point where that stomatal transpiration is reducing heat stress. And so potassium can go out during the high, uh, hot periods of the year. It just should go out when temperatures aren't too high during the day, preferably early morning or night application. <clears throat> uh, 
Oh, and another question here. This one comes from Melissa. She wants to know if a uh, what the rates are recommended for any boron products. Um, it would depend on the boron product. We uh, we have a our own boron uh, soil product called Boron Boost Soil. I, I forgot to mention before or to elaborate further. Boron is typically mobile within the soil when there is sufficient soil water. It is an anion and it moves quickly. But as soon as that water, uh, soil water dries up and that soil dries out, if you have high calcium in your soil, boron can be quickly bound to that calcium. There's a lot of research that has shown that, that we have a uh, boron deficiencies in high calcium soils. Our boron brew soil product is actually complex to prevent that tie up with calcium. Um, but we still, for wine grapes, I would recommend a, sh a uh, lower rate, maybe just, I would say, a quart an acre via the soil, or even one to two pints, just to supply enough boron necessary for that bud development, uh, cell division, and, and next year's bloom. Uh, another question here from Daryl based on how many units of potassium we hope to apply, say 60 to 80 pounds, um, that's, uh, that's probably in the ballpark of what people might be shooting for for wine grapes. How many units of potassium would be reasonable to incorporate into our soil application plans to lower our soil applied potassium products? Um, oh, I think he means to say to incorporate into our foliar application plans to lower our soil applied potassium products. Basically saying, uh, when you apply a foliar potassium, is that going to, how many pounds is that going to make up for in the soil? Uh, very good question. Very good question. Uh, if I was to, I, you know, I would, I would be guessing if I put out a ratio there, if it's uh, efficiency factor of, say, if you apply half a pound of foliar potassium, you're making up 10 pounds of soil applied potassium. Now that's a, a random guess right there. I, I would, it would depend, of course, on your, um, it would depend, of course, uh, upon the foliar uh, raw material you're applying. Potassium acetate has a very high absorption rate, but uh, other ones have lower. So if you have a very high efficient foliar potassium, it, it, I mean, that, that ratio, it is gonna be making up for, for some soil applied potassium, but it should also be known, of course, that these foliar, applications are meant to supplement a soil application. So I would still apply what you think is necessary via the soil. And these foliar applications is to hedge your bets and also to have these other effects I mentioned, such as hoping to raise the bricks in grapes, having an effect on berry color and uh, wine and stress as well. Um, when we have low transpiration and less irrigation, we do not have as high a potassium uptake. And as we know, later in the year, we sometimes back off on irrigation or there may be some reason why we're not getting enough water on that's gonna reduce potassium flow. So when you apply a foliar potassium, you're helping to hedge against those sort of events where you may have a deficiency because of these things that are outside of your control. Uh, Brittany here uh, asked if we have any uh, experience seeing the differences between an FBS crop program versus a traditional grape program in California wine grapes. A, uh, well, I can just speak to some of the impacts that we have seen with FBS products going out there. One of the, one of the things on early on in grape development for new plantings, and we have seen this for a lot of perennial crops, applying transit itself. So we have, we didn't mention it today in the presentation, but we have that biostimulant transit as its own separate product. And it really has um, in a wide variety of prenatal crops increase the establishment and growth, early growth of these new plantings. And so we just see a larger trunk size diameter over the first three years when we apply transit via the soil, both in almond trees and in wine grapes as well. So the quicker that we can get these new plantings producing a crop, the quicker that we're going to have a return on investment for the huge amount of money invested to, um, to plant these, these vineyards, especially in the high, high cost areas like California. So transit as a biostimulant, we have seen and measured an increase in growth rate when applied to new plantings. And so that's one thing. 
And then also just uh, helping to build up canopies, healthier green canopies in the area that we are, we are farming. Um, some vineyards uh, out there had very clear deficiency symptoms of nutrients like iron and zinc early in the season when temperatures are cool in these high alkalinity situations. They were not applying any of these, these nutrients such as episcientists had. We did not see those deficiency symptoms and that led to a healthier canopy and uh, a lack of seeing those um, deficiencies out there because of using the FBS crop program. And I, um, I, I think I was remiss in mentioning as well, the, uh, that transit technology that, that does have that biostimulant effect it is incorporated into the Zycron and Zycan products. So Zycron, again, was that soil applied zinc and Zycan is just as CAN17 uh, counterpart, the Zycron, but it's uh, CAN17 compatible counterpart. Both of those products do have transit incorporated them. So not only are they chelated with these natural chelators, um, and I will mention that like Calron, Zycron is a, a very low pH, like a two pH, which in our rhizosphere of our plants, we want it to be acidic. Plants like to have an acidic rhizosphere, they're doing it themselves. Um, that is the nature of our products too, they are acidic in nature. But on top of that, those chelating abilities, we do incorporate that transit technology, uh, that biostimulant, which is having this effect on improving nutrient mobility of hard to move nutrients like zinc and also improving nutrient uptake and reducing abiotic stress, such as comes from heat stress, uh, frost stress, um, salt stress, um, and drought as well. So thank you, Eddie, for that question. Okay, with that last question, I would like to uh, wrap it up here. I really appreciate everybody coming out. We will keep you informed of the next, um, uh, next presentation in our Crop Master series. I think next month it is gonna be on almonds. And so if you know anyone that is interested in, in seeing about nutrient demands of almonds during the summer, that is what the next crop is that we will focus on. Again, we will have a almond farmer um, start the presentation off and then we will move on into the nutritional demands of almonds throughout the summer months. So thank you for joining. We hope to see you again at our next uh, Crop Master Series program. Um, please refer to our website or, or contact us with any questions, concerns, or interest in our, in our programs and technology.